Africa. So now we have Tara that she's going to talk about nutrition and nets. And I'm going to leave you with her expert hands. Please feel free to ask questions after the presentation. Okay, um, welcome everyone. It's nice to see lots of familiar faces that I've seen before in clinic um, and, and call up quite regularly as well. Um, so I'm going to take you through um, a 30 minute presentation and then we'll have questions at the end. Um, so, so basically, why are we worried about food? Why is it important? Why is your diet and whole important? It's because it's one of the things that you can actually control, which is really important to people and their quality of life. And if you do it right, then you can really improve your symptoms with neuroendocrine tumours. Um, so we, we don't use it as a sole treatment. Of course, we use medicines um, and different therapies in NETS. Um, but there are, um, you know, we, we can stabilise your weight. We can decrease recovery time after an operation or different therapies um, and try and maximise the outcome of, of your treatment. Um, nutraceuticals is a nutrient which in high doses in some studies can have a pharmaceutical effect. Um, and there's things like curcumin, green tea, lots of studies in other tumour types that might help um, neuroendocrine tumours, but we'll talk about that um, at the end. Um, so going through weight, not all the slides will apply <coughs> to you, um, but hopefully you, you'll be able to relate to the majority of the slides. So when we look at weight and we look at your height and your weight, we calculate your ideal BMI and that is between 20 and 24.9. If you're a bit below that, say 19, we're not worried so much, but if it goes um, around 18 below, um, we'd class you as underweight. So trying to get you in the ideal range. It's nice to have a few inches spare if possible if you're going through a treatment because then you can afford to lose a bit as well. Um, weight gain is common in insulinomas. I'm not sure whether we've got any insulinoma patients in the room. Um, and weight loss is common in, in hormone producing tumours, especially when you're malabsorbing. You've got diarrhoea, um, fatty diarrhoea, which is steatorrhea, and nutrients are wasted um, through losing too much energy through your stools. Um, and also from surgery. So how to gain weight? Um, We've got to nip the energy losses in the bud. First of all, if you're not absorbing food or if you're sometimes running around or you're too stressed, you're using up too much energy. So we'll nip those in the bud first. And then we'll opt for a high energy and high protein diet. Um, net patients have a very high protein requirement um, as, as a rule, really. So so double really in the amount of protein. The best sources of protein are meat and fish. If you don't want those, then there's, there's dairy products, bees, beans, peas, nuts, lentils, things like that. Um, prescribed energy drinks, so the, the milkshakes, of which there are several brands out there, depending on your area that you live in. Um, and there's juices, there's powders, lots of different options. Um, if you see your nurse or dietitian. Peptamin and Vital 1.5 are good milkshakes if you have a sensitive stomach and you notice that the others are causing diarrhoea. Um, and if you're severely underweight, then we would consider tube feeding. So um, the first option would just be a temporary tube that supplements the rest of your diet, which is a nasogastric tube, which goes up your nose into your tummy and just drips while you're not really thinking about eating and then you can eat food on top of that. That's mainly as an inpatient if you're unwell though. So for insulinoma patients, um, it's very important to um, regularly test your blood every couple of hours and not to have sugary snacks unless your glucose level is low. Um, exercise according to guidelines, 
but always beware that your sugar can go too low and always carry snacks with you. Um, and then there's two different ways of treating a hypo and this applies to anyone with diabetes as well. It's the same rules. So first, if you're having a hypo, you go for a low to medium glycemic index food. So that's a food that slowly releases carbohydrate as glucose into your bloodstream. And um, basically, if, if your blood level is over four millimoles, um, eat some starchy carbohydrate. That's supposed to say under four millimoles. <laughs> um, for example, you need a banana, you need a, slick, uh, a thick slice of toast or half a sandwich or a bowl of cereal, all these starchy things. Um, we class a hypo as, as under four millimoles as a rule. Uh, and then step two, um, you would have a very sugary food. So that would be um, four to five dextrose tablets, wine gums, uh, six of those, five licorice all sorts, uh, Lucozade Energy, 115 mils, which is a few sips really, Lucozade Sport, much more of that needed, half a can of Ribena, um, and so the list goes on. And then after that, you need to check your blood glucose levels, do the finger prick again after 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and if it's still under four, then you need to repeat the treatment. Um, and you can repeat all over again, so you go through the same process. Um, okay, so on to a different subject, um, hormone-related deficiency. So when you have a tumour that's pumping out hormones like serotonin um, and the, the carcinoid type nets, we um, have to watch out that you firstly don't get niacin deficiency because that's very common um, and you should be on vitamin B co-strong tablets, um, sometimes one a day but it's usually two to three a day and they've got plenty of niacin as along with other B vitamins in there to balance things out because B vitamins work together. Um, or you can take a nicotinamide tablet around 40 milligrams a day. There's no set guidelines for this at all. So we just um, try and make the best possible guess for you. If you're flushing a lot, you've got a lot of hormone related diarrhea, we'd think that you would probably need the highest dose. Um, and then if you've had diarrhoea, um, just, just watery diarrhoea that's hormone related, you would, um, you kind of more at risk of magnesium, zinc, iron, copper um, deficiencies, and you can have oral replacement, so tablets basically. Um, and if there's any Vipoma patients in the room, um, potassium and phosphorus is, is at risk as well. Um, so patients on somatostatin analogues, mm, the data shows that, that um, not all patients have problems with the pancreas, um, but a fair few patients do get affected pancreas um, from taking the somatostatin analogue um, injections in that it reduces the amount of enzymes that break down your food. So if your enzymes aren't breaking down your fat, the fat soluble vitamins that dissolve in there actually don't go into your blood. You just, um, they they're come out as waste in your stools. So you are at risk if you do have fatty stools and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and they're vitamins A, D, E and K1 that have been found in one study to be low in patients. Um, the other one, vitamin B12, is common after surgery um, to the stomach and to the terminal island, which is the very last bit of your small bowel. Um, and during somatostatin analogues as well. So it's a good idea if we check those levels. Um, and for those, for both of those studies, we try to test your levels 
um, after 18 months of starting on the injections. So on to bowel problems. So what we want to know when we see you is what do your stools look like? It might sound disgusting, but we need to know this for everyone. Uh, we want to know what colour they are, how do they look, do they float, do they sink, um, are they greasy, how many times a day you go. That um, sometimes means that you go on to certain therapies and not certain therapies. So it's a very important question. Um, and do they happen after food or drinks? So is it your hormone talking or is it the food? Okay, so very important. Um, and you can write down your symptoms in relation to your food and do a food and symptom diary. Usually symptoms, if it's related to food or drink, will happen within a few hours or definitely the same day. You might be able to see a pattern. Um, and when did it all start happening? Was it related to a treatment starting? Was it related to surgery? Was it, you know, after you'd had a, a tummy bug, after you'd had antibiotics? So those kind of things. So previously I'd talked about diarrhoea and I'd mentioned fatty stools, which we call ste steatorrhea. So diarrhoea we call more than 200 grams of stool per day or more than three liquid motions per day, and l urgency with faecal incontinence, so rushing to the loo, you can't hold it in. Steatorrhea, frothy stools, presence of an oily film on the top of the wash in the toilet, um, variable colour between pale yellow, orange and grey, but the analogue injections can also cause very pale stools as well, so beware of that. Um, floating stools and also incontinence. So if we're looking at diarrhoea, so something that's not fatty, um, we know that it could be a, as a result of surgery, it could be the hormones, it could be an intolerance or a new infection. If it's out of the ordinary, you need to mention it to your doctor or your nurse. Um, and sometimes we can do stool tests. Um, the advice would be to eat little and often. Um, sometimes if you have had an infection, reducing lactose in your diet might be able to help. Definitely until the diarrhoea has cleared. Um, and that might be a couple of weeks because you've become intolerant to it. Your intestines have become inflamed and they're not absorbing um, and breaking down lactose like they once were. Um, and the other thing is um, probiotics. So um, those are la live bacteria and lactobacilli and bifidobacteria are the ones that we focus on mainly. Um, and they are added to your gut to try and sort out the problem in some way. So it's if you have an infection or overgrowth of a type of bacteria, it try and sorts the problem out and evens the numbers out. Um, we're not sure whether it's best to, to give um, the probiotics during chemotherapy. Most people would say no if you're at risk of high having neutropenia, which is low neutrophils. Um, you're at risk of picking up an infection from anything really, um, not just high risk foods. If you add a probiotic in, adding bacteria could actually give you an infection. Um, there's only one, um, one type of probiotic that ever has been documented, and that's a yeast type of probiotic. They're not the lactobacilli, not the bifidobacteria. Um, so it's, if you do want to take a probiotic, you need to discuss it with your medical team if you have chemotherapy. And it needs to be a high dose as well. Um, steatorrhea, so this is the fatty stools. Um, so the treatment, first of all, is um, we'll put you on Creon. Creon's an enzyme. It has um, fat breaking down enzymes. It'll break down protein. It'll break down the carbohydrate. But fat's the main one that we're worried about because that's what leads to most of the symptoms. Um, if Creon doesn't work, we'll try different brands afterwards. 
So roughly, depending on what brand you go on, you start on 25,000 capsules and you'd have one of those for a snack and then you'd have two of those for a meal and then most people get up to three of those um, for a main and two of those for a snack. And if you're at that dose, you might as well take the bigger ones, which are 40,000, which is one for a snack and then two for a main meal. Um, but it's important that if you have a dessert, then you take some more because they only last 30 to 40 minutes in the stomach. And also, at the beginning of the day, I would advise if you're on Enmetrazole or um, Pantoprazole or, or any of the PPIs, the, the stomach acid reducing drugs, then you, you take that at the beginning of the day, wait half an hour, then have your creon start eating. If you don't have your PPI at the beginning of the day, it might actually um, not allow the creon or the, the enzymes to start working. Um, all of the enzymes should be taken with your first mouthful of food. Um, and if you don't take enough, you'll sometimes see it in your stools. If you're just having loose stools, no e evident fat in them, we can do a stool sample and see if there really is some in there or not. Um, and we might be able to see some difference in your um, vitamin blood tests, so the vitamin D, A, D, E and K will be able to see if you've been absor uh, malabsorbing for some time. Um, and it's also common to see some weight loss as well if you're not absorbing all that energy. So food triggers of carcinoid syndrome. So um, it's in the food and nets book that we have. We've got thousands of copies of these books. So if you didn't get one today, please pick one up from the hospital. Um, so there's, there's a couple of studies around this. So these are the common things that cause triggers in carcinoid syndrome. So they cause diarrhea, they cause breathlessness, or they cause flushing. And um, large fatty meals, especially saturated fats, so the animal fats, have been um, found to cause a big problem. So we say that you should have lots of small meals if you notice they are. Some people, they don't. So it's not one size fits all kind of diet. Um, spice can cause flushing especially. Um, alcohol can cause a problem. So I always say that eating a big Indian meal with lots of lager is pretty much your worst nightmare. <laughs> but um, yeah, for some people it might be fine. Um, and then the, the food's high in amines, so not really sure about the science around this, but over in the States, one of the dietitians um, specialising in nets um, links certain foods which are high in um, fermented uh, byproducts of proteins, basically. And these are aged cheese, um, the sum, in some alcohols that are aged, smoked and salted fish and meat, yeast, fermented tofu, miso and sauerkraut. Um, so if you do notice any of those are causing diarrhea or flushing or wheezing, then get rid of them from your diet. <laughs> um, foods moderate in amines, so large doses of caffeine. If you're having more than four cups of tea or coffee a day, it might be a problem. Um, chocolate, peanuts, Brazil nuts, coconut, avocado, banana, raspberries, um, most soybean products and broad beans. Um, so in the same way, if you're having lots of those and you notice a problem, then it's probably a good idea to reduce them. So coexisting IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome, um, with one of the studies that I'm doing is looking at symptoms of IBS. A lot of Patients are diagnosed in the first place with IBS before they even get diagnosed with the NET. But it's important for us to realise just because you've got the NET that you still might have IBS because the tumour can affect your gut, the way it behaves, um, and you can still have IBS type diarrhoea and wind and constipation and alternating bowel habits. So um, 
if we've tried everything else, then there's something called the low FODMAP diet, which is, is available through me. Um, and um, yeah, you just need to be referred to me, basically, if, if you think you've tried everything. Um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Some of you might have heard of this. So it's similar symptoms to IBS. Um, and I usually see it if I've tried everything, diet, if it's stable disease, there's no change in drugs, but there might have been some surgery. Um, people with diabetes might have had altered bowel function called gastroparesis. Something's gone on. Basically, it's where the bacteria from the colon migrate up to the small intestine for some reason. And the bacteria that normally grow in the bowel shouldn't be growing up that far. And it causes especially lots of very watery diarrhoea, 10, 20 times a day. It would, it would be something that would be quite sudden um, and noticeable and very unpleasant. So if we do suspect that and we've kind of excluded everything else in the normal stool test, then we do a lactulose hydrogen breath test, which is measuring the amount of gas that comes out of your breath um, after having lactulose, which is a solution. And um, we then treat it with antibiotics. We can try reducing the FODMAP, such as lactose, um, in your diet, which reduces the amount of food that the bacteria are allowed to feed on. And then probiotics, there's a few studies around to show if you have antibiotics plus probiotics at the same time, that it delays the need to go back onto probiotics and it might even prevent it from coming back. So it's about 50% reoccurrence rate within nine, nine months, 12 months. So some of you in the room will be well and not really concerned about anything that I've just talked about. So basically, if you have no symptoms at all, then you first of all need a high protein diet, which I talked about on the first slide. Um, lots of lean meats. I say lean meat because if you react to the fat in any way in terms of a carcinoid trigger, uh, it might be a problem for you. Um, so lean red meat, lots of white meat, fish, especially oily fish is very good. Um, and dairy, if you tolerate dairy. Um, eat a rainbow of fruit and veg. So lots of different colours, get different colours for lunch, different colours in there for evening meal. Um, like the healthy um, guidelines for everyone else, two fruit, three veg per day at least. Um, and then we'll every if you're on a somatostatin analogue, we aim to monitor your vitamins every 18 months and we'll treat them if they are low okay um, and complementary medicines so nutrition does come in here so complementary is not alternative um, there are anti-tumor effects as i said earlier um, curcumin is an extract from the spice turmeric which is the indian spice um, that has been shown to be uh, have anti-tumor effects in a lot of cancers. Hasn't been tested in nets at all, um, but for the equivalent pancreatic tumors, bowel tumors, um, almost everything, um, it it either reduces, it stops growth in the first place, or reduces the growth. So it's something that we're looking at. Green tea, effective in pancreatic cancer and bowel cancer again. There's been one study using um, an extract from hops and it's called xanthohumol. It's extracted from hops and has been shown to be effective in carcinoid cell lines and bronchial nets. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on. I'm sure there'll be more studies on that one as well. And resveratrol, which is an extract from um, red grapes, and that's been um, used in a study on low-grade GI nets. <coughs> and I think those results are due out this year. I haven't seen the results yet. Um, 
which basically they'll be looking for shrinkage of a tumour to see whether it actually works. And then probiotics, as I've talked about before, so adding in beneficial bacteria to, to sort out any imbalance if there is one, um, but also probiotics work with the immune system. Most of the immune system is in your gut, um, not in your blood. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a benefit um, to everyone, really, to take some kind of probiotic. And so we've got the Food and Nets booklet, which I was going to wave at you, but I don't have one now. <laughs> <laughs> so one of these. Um, so we've got lots and lots. Um, and um, also the Net Patient Foundation have printed a bigger size of those. Um, and then the Net Patient Foundation also have printed one specifically on insulinomas with the diet advice in there. Vipomas, carcinoid tumours, they've got the website. Um, specific nutrient information is quite good on the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre website, which is in New York. Um, and if you, you, know, you want to know about vitamin C, you can just type it in there and they're quite good um, at telling you how it is, you know, what the evidence is uh, for, for different therapies and supplementing in some way. So that's it. Thank you so much, Tara, for okay. such an informative talk. No, no, keep, keep it away. Keep it away. Come, come, come to the centre. <laughs>